So let me share with you what our aim is in this teaching series. It's going to start today. Uh, we have a flyer. If you didn't get a flyer, you have some in the back. It's going to start today, March 23, end on May 11, Mother's Day weekend. Our aim is not surface snorkeling. Has anyone been snorkeling before? Raise your hand if you have, please. I have been snorkeling before, and I enjoy snorkeling. But there's something that I haven't done yet, and I need to get my license, which is scuba diving. Has anyone gone scuba diving before? Okay, there's a few here. I know Jay has gone scuba diving before. Our aim in this teaching series is not surface snorkeling. We want to go deep. We want to scuba dive. And I wonder, why should we even read this Bible, which I call the storybook? Why should we even pray? Why should we even come to church? Why should we even tune in online if we're going to be bored and go through the motions? I want to encourage you to join me in scuba diving in the scripture. Do you want to join me in that? To not just stay at the surface, but to go scuba diving and allow scripture, allow, allow God to show us beautiful insights in his word. So that's what we're going to do. And I believe that the Bible's aim that, that we, we read, that many of us who are believers read, is not just information, its primary aim is transformation, and that's what we're at in this teaching series. And so there are two primary audience, audiences that uh, I'd like to speak to and address today. First, this teaching series is uh, for those of us who are non-believers, or maybe uh, friends who are non-believers. So this flyer is to be used for us to invite family and friends to tune in and to listen to the teaching series, okay? And so these are invitation cards, so feel free to, to grab, we have, grab some, we have, we have a few, and share this with a friend. Also, you'll notice in the back, we want to hear from you. Uh, so there's even a QR code here that you can scan and ask any question about this series or God. The pastoral team will see it, and we're going to aim to try to answer some of those questions as we hear and read the questions from you. So first, primary audience, non-believer. Second audience, for those of us who are believers and we feel like we're just going through the motions, my, I believe God's desire is to take us deeper than we have ever been. And what we're going to do in this teaching series is to learn how God changes us, changes us, and he reshapes us. So this morning's teaching, the first uh, of our sermon series, is going to answer the question, uh, what is the heart? We're going to learn about the thief on the cross, really the two thieves on the cross in, in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to see the difference between a hard heart and a soft heart. And we're going to ask, how can we have a softer heart? Okay, so we're going to look at what happens when we have a hard heart. Then we're going to look at what happens when we have a soft heart. And we're going to ask, how can we have a softer heart? So I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Uh, in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. If you don't have a physical one, that's okay. Use your smartphone, use your tablet, uh, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. The primary passage is on your bulletin, so you can even look on your bulletin as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to start in Luke chapter 23, and we will start with verse 32. So Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Let me share with you a little bit about the background. This is the time when Jesus is about to be crucified. Jesus is going to, uh, he's, he's carrying his cross. Uh, in verse 26, the, the Luke says, As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way from the country, and put the cross on him and made, it, made him carry it behind Jesus. And so you can imagine Jesus, he's already been beaten by the Roman soldiers. He's walking, Simon is carrying the cross behind him. And then they placed Jesus on the cross, and now we're going to pick it up now in verse 32. And I'm in the New International Version, okay? So New International Version, Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. Two other men. How many men? Okay. Both criminals were also led out with him to be executed. They were criminals. Another gospel writer says that they were thieves. So these two criminals were thieves. Verse 33, when they came to the place called the skull, that's Calvary, they crucified him there, speaking about Jesus, along with the criminals, one on his right 
and the other on his left. And then Jesus, Jesus says something that is so profound and that is hard for many of us to say, especially when people are hurting us. You know what Jesus says in verse 34? He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Question for you. Does it appear that Jesus has a hard heart or a soft heart? He has a soft heart. Unlike the revilers and the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leaders who were screaming, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus has a soft heart. But notice the contrast here. Look at verse 35. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. The Greek word, the original language, the Greek word for sneer is this idea of, you know, uh, crumpling up your, your nose and mocking someone. They sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. So they're sneering at him. They're ridiculing the Messiah. Messiah. Question, does that sound like a soft heart or is it a hard heart? Sounds pretty hard to me. Look at verse 36. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. Okay, that word mock is another word for slander or ridicule. The image that came to my mind, do we have any Chicago Bulls fans from the 90s when Jordan was playing? There was this highlight clip, I remember when Scottie Pippen, who was second in command there in the Bulls, dumped over Patrick Ewing and then pushed him on the ground and walked over him and just and looked at him. Some of you remember that play. You've seen that highlight. That's the image that came to my mind when I think of mocking. Pippin was mocking Patrick Ewing. The soldiers are mocking the Messiah. And the text continues in verse 36. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then the, the text says in verse 38, there was, there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. The people that are around Jesus, the, the, the crowd, does it sound like they have a soft heart or a hard heart? They have a hard heart. And then now Luke, the writer, zooms in on the two thieves, one on his right, one on his left. Look at the first thief. Verse 39. One of the criminal, criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. So the crowd was sneering at him. The crowd was mocking him, at him. And the criminal that's on the cross, the first one, has the audacity to hurl insults, to mock him. And he mocks the Messiah and he says, aren't you the Messiah? In verse 39. Save yourself and us. The word, the phrase hurled insights uh, can also be translated in the English Standard Version as he railed at him. The original word for hurled insults in the Greek is the word blasphemeo, by which we get the word blasphemy. It means to demean through speech an especially sensitive manner in an honor and shame oriented society. Those of us who come from an honor and shame oriented society understand that you do not just slander and call out people in authority. You don't slander your elders or your parents. You just don't do this. In the Western world, uh, it's a little bit different here in the West. But in the East, and especially in majority world honor and shame cultures, you never blaspheme those in authority. To speak, it means that this thief was speaking in a disrespectful way that's demeaning Jesus, denigrating him, and maligning him. Uh, the the uh, illustration that I thought of as I was preparing this was, uh, you remember in the, in the 90s, I remember this circling around my peers, was uh, yo mama jokes. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yo mama jokes, right? So, um, and they, were, they weren't really nice, right? Your mama did this and your mama did this, right? And I remember when I was around 10 years old uh, that my peers would share your mama jokes, right? Talking about each other's moms. I remember, I might have shared this illustration before in class, right? There at North Shore uh, Junior Academy. One time uh, I was in eighth grade and seventh and eighth grade were together. And one of my friends started mocking my other friend's mom and sharing his name, my friend got, got so upset 
because, uh, because the other friend, this apparent friend, was mocking his mom that he got up and, and was about to punch him. He said, you don't do that. Don't talk about my mom that way, right? Sometimes, like the arrogant thief, we go a little too far with our words. We insult, we denigrate, we malign others. This hard-hearted, arrogant thief is going too far. And the question is, why is the arrogant thief maligning and slandering the Messiah? Why is he going too far? You know why? Because this is who he is. This is who the arrogant thief is. But he didn't become this arrogant, hard-hearted, maligning thief overnight, did he? You know, there's a proverb that appears in ancient philosophy, wisdom literature, religious traditions. I was reading that this even goes back far, 2,300 years ago, uh, 300 years before Jesus was walked on even on planet Earth. And the logic goes like this, and here's the proverb. You ready for it? You've heard this before. You sow a thought, it reaps an action. You sow an action, it reaps a habit. You sow a habit, it reaps a character. And you sow a character, it reaps a destiny. It starts with a thought, which leads to an action. Then that action becomes easier and it becomes a habit. And then that habit is something that becomes part of you and it becomes your character. And that character determines your, that character determines your destiny. The arrogant thief did not become a hard-hearted thief overnight. One thought of stealing, hmm, maybe I should steal from that, those, those, those poor people over there and steal their money, right? One thought of stealing led him to steal, and then the next time it became easier, and then after 15 to 20 times it became even easier, and then he became a thief because, you see, A thought yields an action, and that action yields a habit, and that habit yields a character, and that character yields your destiny. Friends, our characters are formed by a thousand choices, one decision at a time. Let me share share that again. Our characters are formed, are shaped by a thousand choices that we make, one decision at a time. I'm going to share this graphic on the screen. Uh, Pastor Rodney and I are sharing this sermon series. I just finished this amazing book, and I would highly recommend it. I agree with 98% of the book. 2% I don't. But there's a lot of useful framing in here. Uh, One of our elders, Uncle Bing, introduced me to this pastor, author, John Mark Comer, and then I bought his book called Live No Lies. Amazing book. It is amazing. I I promise you. I couldn't put it down. I just finished it this week. Live No Lies. And he, he spells out in about 300 pages this, or 200 pages, this model of how we become who we are. And we'll, we'll, I'll unpack this more, but I just want to share this, this model with you to point out one thing. Notice he shares, and he, he broke his book up into three parts. One, there are deceptive ideas, lies, that, and he says it comes from the enemy, right? Then that play to dis, dis, disorder desires, the second level, which is our flesh, which already has a, a tendency to do evil and to think evil, right? And then the third layer is that are normalized or it becomes habitual in a, in a sinful society, Okay? And I'll flesh this out in future weeks, but notice, deceptive ideas, wrong ideas, top layer, then play on us, uh, on our disordered desires, right? Many of us, we don't put God first and we put other things first and it plays with our disordered desires and then we end up doing crazy things. And then those behaviors which are based on false beliefs are then normalized in a sinful society, And this, according to John Mark Homer, is just another way way of saying, look, certain thoughts, bad thoughts, lead to bad actions, which leads to habits, which leads to character, which leads to destiny. And this, I like this model. You know, they say that all models are wrong, some are useful. This is a useful model. 
Because we're seeing that there is, according to Scripture, that there is an enemy that, that shares lies, that plays to our disordered desires, and then those desires which we begin to practice in our lives become normalized in a sinful society. Let me share with you a quote from John Mark Homer in his book, Live No Lies. Excellent book. He says this, The things that we do do something to us. They shape, what word did I say? They shape the people we become. No wonder Jesus comes into our lives to reshape us because we've already been shaped in false ways. John Mark Homer continues, Take the all-too-common example of an affair, one of the few sexual taboos that's still generally recognized, though that's changing in today's society. He says, in all my years as a pastor, I have never known anyone who just woke up one morning in a happy, healthy marriage and had an affair that night. In every case, the affair started not with the act of infidelity, but with a thousand earlier acts. The choice to skip date night, to quit couples counseling, to make a flirtatious comment to a coworker, to allow a certain kind of film into the entertainment queue, those are the things that led to that behavior. He continues, the affair itself was the result of not one, but a thousand choices, choices made over a long period of time, which all built to a head and brought ruin from the substrata to the surface of a life, right? From the deep to the surface. And then he shares this, or take a less dramatic and far more humdrum example, like let's say negativity. And then he says, I can speak to this one as an expert and I can relate to this. I can relate to him. He says, with every decision that we make to complain, to criticize, to play the victim, to focus on the negative, and so on, we become more and more the kind of person who is by nature negative, grouchy, unhappy, and unpleasant to be around until eventually we lose the very capacity to live happily, gratefully, and full of wonder at our lives in God's good world. Do you see what he's saying? These deceptive ideas, they play to disorder desires and they become a habit. Or in other words, we have a thought that leads to an action, which leads to a habit, which leads to our character, which leads to our destiny. And depending on what thoughts we allow to, to think and act on, it shapes who we become. But then, I like how John Mark Homer switches it to the positive and he says, but again, the reciprocal is true as well. And friends, this is where, this is where I would love to be at for myself and for this community of faith. But again, the reciprocal is true as well. The daily decision to rejoice, to cultivate a way of seeing our lives in God's good world, not through the lens of our phones, our news apps, or, or flesh, but through gratitude, celebration, and unhurried delight. I like that. In a world that we're, we're so hurried, right? Got to get to school. What's the weather? Right? through gratitude, celebration, and unhurried delight will over time form us. What will it do? It will form us or reshape us into joyful, thankful people who deeply enjoy life with God and enjoy life with others. And he says, what starts as an act of the will will eventually turn in our inner nature and what begins with a choice eventually becomes a character. Do you see what John Mark is saying? Do you see what's happening to the arrogant thief? The, John Mark saying, look, we can choose good thoughts to be unhurried and to sit still and to celebrate and to enjoy God which then will change our actions and then change our character, it will change our habits and our character and our destiny. But it, we see from the arrogant thief, the wrong thought led to the wrong action, led to the wrong, wrong habits, wrong character, and wrong destiny. The arrogant thief is hard-hearted because he made a thousand choices to do evil one decision at a time. And the heart, his heart is callous, his heart is uncaring. He doesn't care about the Messiah. He, he is hurling insults at the Messiah. His heart is cold, as cold and hard as a frozen lake in a Chicago winter. So what happens to a person whose heart is hard? What happens? A person with a hard heart can never be wrong. 
A person with a hard heart is never wrong. It's always the other person. The arrogant thief was a criminal. He was being justly punished for his crimes. Yet he could not feel remorse for his wrongdoing. He couldn't because there was nothing wrong with him. He was so bent upon evil that that's what he was. He, he was just evil. And instead of feeling remorse for being up there and being crucified, and when, when, when people were crucified uh, in these, during these times, in these Roman times 2,000 years ago, they were crucified without clothing to ridicule them and to mock them. I mean, this was the epitome of punishment. And instead of feeling remorse for what he did, the arrogant thief had a hard heart. He was never wrong. He couldn't see how he was wrong. And instead, he hurls insults at the Messiah. The arrogant thief was full of himself. But, you know, he was so different from the other thief that we're going to learn about. Look at this in verses 40 and 41. Luke 23, verses 40 and 41, just those two verses right now. The story says in Luke 23, 40, verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. All right, so here's the other one. Dude, what, did you, are you serious? Did you just call out the Messiah? What's up with that? Verse 40, the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? And then look what he says in verse 41. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. We're getting what we deserve. But this man, this Messiah, he has done nothing wrong. Notice, this second thief's character is night and day from the first arrogant thief. You have the arrogant thief on one side. Now you have the humble thief on the other side. The second humble thief is saying, look what he says in verse 40. Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? Yo, arrogant thief, what are you doing? Don't you fear God? In other words, can you not feel your guilt before God since you are being crucified like he is? And then he says in verse 41, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. The humble thief knows that he's messed up. The humble thief, he sold the wrong act wrong thoughts, which sowed the wrong actions, which, which then yielded the wrong habits, which yielded the wrong character, which yielded the wrong destiny, right? He is a thief. He is a criminal. His heart is hard. But notice what's happening on the cross. His heart begins to soften. It begins to soften, soften from a hard rock to, to soft clay. And here's the good news, friends. The good news is this. That even if we have been in the habit of sowing the wrong thoughts, actions, habits, which leading to, the wrong, or to really a really bad, hard-hearted character, which is determining our destiny, that even when we are at the, are the very last chance of our lives, God can still soften our hearts. And there might be someone here thinking, well, I don't, how do I know that I don't have a hard heart? I don't want to be like the arrogant thief. I do want to share with you the very fact that you may be worrying and anxious about, oh man, have I just committed the unpardonable sin and am I just too hard? The very, the very fact that you think that means that your heart is beginning to soften. It's, becoming, it's, it's starting to become more malleable. And this thief on the cross, this, er, this, this arrogant thief and the humble thief, you know, have you heard of the term deathbed confessions, <laughs> right? So the, the theory, right, the theory is, at least the working idea, right, this, and I, in my humble opinion, it's a deceptive idea, but this idea that we see in our world today, even in church religious settings, is let me sow my wild oats and finally have fun, like, like I'm going to have fun with my life, and then at the end of my life, I'm going to be like the thief on the cross and, and then humble myself and turn back to God and then he'll save me. So I can have the best of, best of both worlds. I can, have, I, can have all the, I can live in paradise on earth, and I can also live in paradise in heaven. I have two answers to that. Number one, tomorrow's never guaranteed. Okay? And the second is this. Uh, that the idea 
Well, it's based, the idea that I'm going to wait until later to regret because I can have fun now assumes that when you think of church, you don't think of fun and pleasure and happiness. But what I do know, at least for those who follow the Messiah and the storybook, the ones who give their lives to him and who, who, who are martyred for their faith, they find the joy and the happiness that their hearts have been looking for their whole lives. And they're willing to say, you can crucify me even upside down and behead me. I don't care because I've found the joy and happiness that my heart has been looking for. So I don't need, I'd rather be in that joy and, and allow that joy to continue in the future. And my third response is this. Let's take, for example, those who have chosen a different path. And those have, who have ravished and destroyed their lives by a- bad habits, whether it's alcoholism or drug abuse or whatever, right, or negative thinking, you ask people who have, done, who have lived uh, with those patterns for 30 and 40 years if they're happy today and ask if their relationships are thriving and, and their relationships are healthy and, and happy. And many will tell you, no. Here's the, here's the thing. Our hearts are hard but yet it can still soften and the humble thief knows that he is more evil than he thinks he is. And what happens to a person? What happens to a person whose heart is soft? A person with a soft heart, that person can admit that she's wrong. A person with a hard heart, never wrong. The person with a soft heart, that person can can admit, yeah, I'm wrong. People in our modern culture are quick to blame the villains, but slow to take ownership of their faults. We see it in this religious world too. We see it even in our church setting, right here, in this community of faith. It's so easy for us to blame other Christian denominations and other Christian communities and, and, and look how wrong this church was through the centuries. Look how wrong they were. It's so easy for us to point out other people's errors But we are slow to see the errors in our own attitude and in our own teachings. Now, Nestor, what are you saying? Are you saying that we can be off with our understanding of truth? (laughs) Is it possible? I mean, you know, we've grown up in a setting, Pastor, where we have proclaimed, we have the truth, and people need to come up to our level. So let me me share with you an example uh, within our community of faith okay, within our, our specific denomination. So, yeah, so let, me, let me just share an example within our denomination. I was in the state of Michigan a few weeks ago sharing, and then I asked a question in an afternoon session. I said, what is the primary mission of, the, the mission of this community of faith? And then the word was thrown out. And those of you who are not familiar with this phrase, it's found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 14, right? But let me just share with you this phrase. So, they, so the, the, this, the people said, it's the three angels' messages, right? <laughs> okay, so it's the three angels' messages. I said, what is the third angel? Silence. Okay, Revelation 14. Then I gave a quick answer. What's the second angel? Silence. And you can see this in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. What's the first angel, okay? And the first answer that came was, Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. In other words, our task, the main mission is to call people to to fear God and to worship him. And then I asked the question, okay, and now stay with me here and you'll you'll understand my illustration here. I asked the question, before God gave the the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 verses 3 through 17, what did he say before the Ten Commandments in verse 2? God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you Israelites out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In other words, I loved you so much and I saved you. Therefore, I give you the Ten Commandments so that you can continue to have this covenant relationship with me. So meaning that our action or our response or our worship or keeping of the commandments is not the primary way that we have a relationship with God. It is to have a relationship with God and the commandments are not the means to have a relationship, but they are there to maintain the relationship that I have already from a God who gave his life for me. 
And so if you go back to Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, the, the story, and you can see this in your scripture in the, in, in the Bible, it doesn't start with fear God and give him glory. What does the first angel say in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7? John writes, you know, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Why are we not quick to say that the main purpose of our existence as a body of believers is to share the good news? To not do something in order to be saved, but to announce that something has already been done by Jesus. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, Mike. I don't know why I just did that, right? Personified that, Mike. Something has already been done by Jesus. It is not so much a duty, but a declaration. That is the message that I have been leaning into in the last five or six years. And 10 years prior, if you would have known Nestor, I would have been so quick to give you, oh yeah, here's first, second, third angel, but I would have missed the gospel. So is it, very, is it possible? Is it possible for us to be so off in our understanding of truth? And why is it? Why is it in many circles that this good news of Jesus is hidden in plain sight right in front of us? Could it be that the very concepts and the, the way that we structure our ideas becomes the true north of our lives? And those concepts and these way, the way that we frame this and teach this from generation to generation is actually blinding us from the good news of Jesus, of what he has done on Calvary for us. Could it be? Friends, we can be so certain, I can be so certain that I'm right, but be so off course. And friends, I'm speaking to myself. I'm not indicting anyone here. I am talking to myself. It takes humility to be able to say, you know what, I think I'm right now, but I could be wrong. It's hard. It is hard, especially when I know that I am so right. You know what I mean by that? I know I'm right, right? And I even raise the volume of my voice because, you know, we assume that if I raise the volume of my voice, then I'm even more right. And I've quickly learned that just because someone is passionate and screams from a pulpit or wherever doesn't mean that they're right. Because I've done that. I've been wrong. A person with a soft heart can admit that she's wrong. That's the journey that I'm on. I don't know about your journey, but that's my journey. So we've learned that a person with a hard heart is never wrong. Number two, we've learned that a person with a soft heart can admit she's wrong. Last question. How can we then have a soft heart? Well, look what the story says as we wrap up here. Notice verse 42. Then he said, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the humble thief, verse 42. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. This is his last chance of hope. Okay, he's on the cross. He's dying. He's going to lose his life. This is his last chance. And out of desperation and out of a sense of remorse for what he has done in his life, he cries out and he says, Lord, remember me. And notice what Jesus says in verse 43. I love this verse. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you. When someone says truly I tell you and, and starts with that to, to qualify a statement or to, to introduce a statement, he's saying you, you, you can take this to the bank. You can take this to the bank, thief. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me where? In paradise. The word paradise is only used three times in the New Testament. And the meaning of the word paradise is a transcendent place of blessedness. No pain, no suffering, no killing, no evil. And notice what Jesus says about this paradise. Verse 43 again. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. What makes paradise paradise? Paradise is not primarily a location. Paradise is a person. That's why Jesus says, with me. Paradise is not primarily a peaceful, blissful place. Yeah, that's, a great, that's great. Paradise is when I have Jesus' presence. That's why he could say to the thief, truly I tell, to, I, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You already have paradise because you have me next to you. That's paradise. 
Paradise is not a location. Paradise is, is, is having Jesus. God's primary goal is not to get you to heaven. That was never the goal. God's primary goal is not to get you to heaven. His primary goal is to get you. That's his primary goal. And what does the Messiah, what does the Messiah do to get you? Oh, I love what the, um, the theological dictionary, dictionary of the New Testament says about this word paradise. The commentary says this, or the dictionary says this, paradise is opened even to the irredeemable, irredeemably lost man hanging on the cross. And then they say, he has promised fellowship. What word? Fellowship. Does it sound like relationship to you? He has promised fellowship with the Messiah. And then they say, this shows how unlimited is the remission of sins in the age of forgiveness which has now dawned. That's fancy words to say what God offers to this thief on the cross is unlimited forgiveness. The Messiah gets you by offering unlimited forgiveness. One more graphic on the screen, one more verse, and then, and then we're done. Or two more verses, then we're done. Notice this graphic, and I showed this two weeks ago. In this scripture, there are different covenants, but... There is a larger covenant that, uh, a larger covenant that, that um, is an overarching theme in Scripture. And the word covenant is another word for marriage, okay, this marriage between mankind. In, in Scripture, there are four main chapters of this storybook, which I, this Scripture, which I call the storybook. One, there's a God who creates mankind in his image to have perfect relationship with him. But then two chapters later in Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Adam and Eve eat the fruit they, they rebel against God. They think that their way is going to finally give them the happiness that they seek. And they f- end up f- being naked, feeling, seeing their nakedness, ashamed, and covering themselves. So there was a perfect relationship in the first two chapters of Genesis. And then in Genesis chapter 3, sin caused a rupture, a divorce in that relationship. So what was God going to do to fix that relationship? How was he, how was he going to, to bring people back to himself? Well, in order to have a perfect relationship where there would be no sin and no more rupture, something had to happen in that third chapter of the larger story. And what does that third word there say? Restoration. Someone had to do something in order to restore this relationship with mankind. And what would he do? He would offer unlimited forgiveness by his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. That's how he was going to restore his relationship with mankind. God's goal is to restore his relationship with you. That's why he says in in Luke, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, with me. So how can our hearts be softened? Last two verses, go back to verse 40. And here's where we're going to land this plane. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you were under the same sentence. Notice verse 41. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. And then he says this. Don't miss this last phrase. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, the Messiah, has done nothing wrong. The humble thief knows the Messiah's punishment is unjust. He doesn't deserve this. We deserve it. The humble thief sees that he is more evil than he thinks he is. And he deserves this punishment. He owns up. He has a soft heart. And he realizes how evil and wicked and how dark his soul is. But at the very same time, friend, and those of you who, are, who might be experiencing the, the life in darkness, there is good news. At the very same time that the humble thief recognizes that his life is more dark than he thought he, that they can, he can ever imagine, at the very same time, he also sees the beautiful innocence and goodness of the Messiah. And here's my last question. Where is the experiential joy in verse 41? What is it going to soften your heart? Is, are, you going to soften, are you going to receive a softened heart by focusing on the first part of verse 41? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. Will my heart soften by focusing on how bad I am or how good I need to be? Or will my heart soften with the last part of the phrase in verse 41? 
but this man has done nothing wrong. Will my heart soften by seeing my badness and, my, and, and even trying to be a better person? Or will my heart soften by seeing the goodness and the innocence of the Messiah? Which one? You know what religion teaches? The religion teaches practice these rituals, follow the rules well, and then your heart will soften and you'll finally have a relationship. But do you know what the gospel teaches? The gospel teaches, Jesus teaches, that the way you have a restored relationship is never done by keeping rituals and regulations. The way that you have a restored relationship is to actually look not at your own badness or your own goodness, but to look at the goodness of the Messiah, which then causes me to have a restored relationship, which then leads me to follow his rules and his regulations. The emphasis seems subtle and small, but is seismic. And it is the difference, as I've mentioned here, between experiential hell and experiential heaven. The gospel says that I am so bad and wicked that someone had to come to pay the price for my sin to restore my relationship with the Father. And a good God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. A good God came, even though I don't deserve it, and His name was Jesus. And he went all the way to the cross for me 2,000 years ago. He died, and as we're going to learn next weekend, he resurrected. And I believe with all my heart that only God's goodness can soften my heart. That's the only place. So then what can I do to expose myself to God's goodness? Two things. Number one, it means we expose ourselves to Scripture daily. Friends, I don't just want to be a person that just wants to go through the motions of putting nice clothes on and going to a church or just reading good ideas. I, I, maybe you want to join me, but I know for myself, I, don't wanna, I want a deep relationship. And with two friends in this, this community of faith, we have a men's small group. We decided, you know what, guys? Starting tomorrow, so today, this morning, we're going to read one chapter starting from Matthew every single day. And I'm going to text you guys uh, that I read it and also my key insight. This morning, our, our texts were blowing up while I was trying to prepare for church. But it was so amazing. Because I want to expose myself to this amazing story. And I'm making a commitment with my, with my friends to hold me accountable. To read one chapter a day starting with Matthew. Because I know that by exposing myself to Scripture, I can finally see what love looks like. So expose myself to Scripture. And lastly, we expose ourselves to the goodness of the Savior. Last, uh, let me just share with you what happened this morning. I was reading here, and the one text that popped out to me was Matthew 1. It said... Jesus' name is Emmanuel, God with us. Aha. Uh -huh. So I said, the reason why I read scripture is to not get just good ideas and to follow good principles. But the reason I read scripture is to find out how Jesus is so good. That's my bias every time I go into scripture every single day. Not how can I be a better person, but how can I see how God is so good to me? And it colors the way that I approach and read scripture now. And so then when I see that, I'm like, wow, God with us. That's what he wants since the beginning, a relationship with me. And you better believe that's going to motivate me to follow his rules and regulations because I want to maintain that relationship. And so, friend, if there's someone here, as a praise team comes here and sings this song, if there's someone here who is saying, I want a restored relationship with the Messiah. I have been living for myself, living apart, and I want to take that step toward him. We have a connect card in the pew in front of you. It's a... Uh, you could write beginning with a relationship with Jesus or you can mark I'd like to be baptized or join a Bible study group you can mark that as our praise team comes up here and take that moment to, to write it out or maybe you have a question or a thought you want to fill the connect, connect card online we have a QR code and a website you can fill it out and let us know as a pastoral team how we can walk alongside you in your journey with the Messiah but friends there is a God that is even better than you thought he was an innocent one. And may his goodness be the motivation of why we seek him and love him with all our hearts. So we're going to sing the goodness of God. Thank you, praise team, for being here. And we're going to sing the goodness of God. Let's stand together as we sing this closing song.